about sanctions, about food banks, about how people were, um, you know, what we were saying earlier, of a reflection against the, the class struggle, isn't it, of, um, of how do you tackle that, that uh, power. transformation um, just seems more and more um, significant. So we went on a, a little trip. We went to, first of all, we went to my hometown of Nuneaton in the Midlands, which is an industrial town. Um, and uh, the first day we went, the first, within an hour, we met a 19-year-old lad who was not getting any benefits of the housing benefits. And he was in a room provided by a charity was paid for by his housing benefit, and, and he existed on um, casual work, a bit of work to an agency, a bit of the black economy. He just got by, and he um, he was in a room that had a, a mattress on the floor in one corner and a fridge in the other corner. Of that bit. And Paul said to him, he said, can we be really cheeky and see what's in your fridge? And the lad said, yeah. And he opened the door, and there was nothing in the fridge. There was nothing. Not a thing. Um, Paul said, Do you ever go hungry? Uh, and he said, yes. He said, the previous week, he hadn't eaten for three days. And um, this, this is incredible. This, this is a story that is happening to tens of hundreds of thousands of people. So anyway, so we, we, did, we then obviously went into it in, in debt. And the big issue was, as you can imagine, that you're confronted by a mass a bureauc bureaucracy, a mass of regulations, of, of documents, of, and, and hundreds of stories. Um, and and uh, obviously, some people suffer more than others, uh, but it was wherever we went. We went to London, we went to the Midlands, we went to Stoke, we went to Nottingham, we went to the Northwest, we went to Bolton, we went to the Northeast, which is where we eventually did it, we went to Glasgow. And everywhere was the same story. Um, and so, Paul wrote a character, and then he wrote another character, and off we went. Wow. Well, I think, I think you should really explore lives that are quite rarely seen uh, in cinema. And I thought one was so pleased to see this story being told. Um, so many of my friends are going through what they're going through, they're having their lives completely destroyed. And, you know, um, probably a lot of my friends and myself included with that uh, lifelong condition are now being reassessed. Yeah. Um, we used to be given lifetime awards because that was, that was considered scientific. <laughs> uh, but now the government have decided that we all need to be reassessed. Um, so they are, they are wasting millions of pounds, you know, because I send someone around my house every few years to say, are you still wobbly? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, how about I give you a wet shave and we'll find out. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm so grateful that 
that I'll start to some people like you who are using the, you know, art form of the comedy stories. And I'm really interested in what politicised you in your life. Like, was that an event or a moment that made you feel like you wanted to use art as a force for social change? Or was it a process? Or um, was it a burning desire from a very young age? Um, it was a process, really. Um... I mean, I uh, so we went to school in the 40s and early 50s, uh, which is a very quiet time. Um, from this little industrial town in the Midlands, um, managed to get to a university, and um, it was only then that I, I was aware of class because it was one of the posh ones, and it was um, there were there were there were young men there. There were young men. There were young men there who had inherited the world. And they had sports cars that I've never seen before. And they they had they talk about it now as a sense of entitlement. So, but they had a sense of entitlement. They went they'd been to the right schools, they were the sons of uh, empire builders, and um, they were going to inherit the world and they they behaved as they would. And they did, they have. And it was the Bullingdon Club and all the obnoxious people who take part in it. And uh, I was suddenly aware of this of this level of society, um, which I'd never encountered before. I mean, I'm eating this the bill in a lower middle class, never mind anything else. And um, so it was it was very exotic. And then um, I joined the BBC um, in the early sixties and worked with writers. And that was a significant thing. I worked with um, wonderful writers. One in particular, a man called Jim Allen, who was a great socialist writer. Working Irish background, um, worked in Manchester, was lived in Manchester. He, uh, he he was one of that dying breed. Well, it was dying then. I think it's probably not so not so common now. Um, of people who would go to work in find work in order to found a union branch. Wow. So he, he was he was a building worker. He was a dock worker. He was a miner, he started a newspaper in the mines, he, he, he'd go to a building site, he'd get people organised and then he'd be chased off by the foreman. You know? <laughs> great guy, very funny man. Um, and he wrote, I did a lot of films with him and, um, uh, and, and I learned a lot from him. I mean he was, he was a, one of these working class men who, who was completely self-taught. I mean he, in his room he would had one work, one wall full of books, and unlike me, he'd read them all, <laughs> and, and was, was, was terrific. Um, and um, he, he always suspected me of bourgeois tendencies, so if, <laughs> if, if, if he, in order to re-establish his proletarian credentials, he'd, he'd take his teeth out if he were having a disagreement. <laughs> Challenge me to do likewise. Um, but it's a wonderful man, Jim Allen. And, um, but there's Barry Hines um, and Paul Lattis for the last 20 odd years. And, and, um, but it was that, those early, that early writing, which again, the 60s were very political. And we were all, um, when joined the Labour Party to, to uh, support Howard Wilson in 63, I think I joined, and 64 was the election. Um, and it took us a couple of years to see to Howard Wilson and to see that actually it wasn't about changing society at all. Uh, and um, so then there were, it was the time of the anti-Stalinist left that came to prominence and which was part of many different groups. And uh, most of us joined one group or another or were sympathetic. And, and in that was very interesting because it was rigorous politically. And every week you'd be given a, a text Read it by Friday, we're going to discuss it, and won't be so idea if you haven't read it. And so for a few years, I mean, every week I read something, and, and it, it was a political grounding that actually is a, a phrase Jim Allen used to use. He'd say, you need political theory as a map and a compass. If you haven't got that, you don't know the course you need to steer. And I think that, that was very true. I think that's 
how your full effects have made films hard for you, like obtaining funding um, and a view common picket obstacles. Um, a, a lot in the, in the first 30 years or so, yes. Um, for the last 20 have been quite lucky. Um, uh, which, um, because we've had European partners most of that time, right. 25 years actually. We've been very lucky because we've got French co-producers, Belgians, other countries. And what's great about them is, is that they, they tend to respect films in the way they don't hear. So if you've got a, uh, like a British uh, co-producer, they'll, they'll maybe have comments about the script that you don't want to hear. Um, so they say, what about this, that, and the other? We say, well, the, the French like that particularly. So, so, so the, the way that, that um, puts the criticism out of court. Um, but the, 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 the decades, that were, the worst decade was the 80s, right. um, because um, I was trying to do documentaries then, in the middle of the Thatcher onslaught, right. and they got, they got banned. Wow. Um, That's a compliment. Yes. <laughs> I think I got all together. We got we got um, four films banned all together. Two films um, taken out of schedules and delayed until they were useless. Um, I got a theatre production banned. Um, everything I couldn't I couldn't direct traffic in the ages. Um, well, you're really tuning there, and I think we all just think you're really cool for that. <laughs> I work here at CISD, a fantastic movie ten. I'm a, a lifelong, lifelong fan. Um, and you might tell from the accent I'm from the area where you set the movie. Um, one of the things in your movies, all of them, that is remarkable are the cast. And I think that's really true in this movie. Um, I'm the same age as Dave Jones, um, I'm from South Shields. One of the themes that always comes across, I believe, is there but for the grace of God go I. And I think when you've got a job, and you've got a little bit of family and support, people can think that that couldn't happen to them or it doesn't apply to them. So my question and point really is, you know, I think it applies to everybody because it really could happen to somebody out there. I don't know whether you share that. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think that's. I think that was one of the points we wanted to make. We wanted to find <laughs> characters who were not obvious losers, you know, because the the the, um, the stereotype is, oh well, you know, they're lazy, they're feckless. Um, it's a woman with too many children. It's um, it's, a, it's someone who's addicted, you know. And so, it's, what do you expect? And so, we wanted to to, to, to find characters. Uh, not, not to say that, of course, everyone needs to be treated with dignity and respect and, and helped, of course, whatever their circumstances. But we didn't want to give the right way an easy, uh, an, an easy put down. So the characters, um, it, it, like, as you say, almost everybody is a few paychecks away from disaster. Um, and, uh, and he's at the older end of the Labour market says it's not going to be easy to find a job. He's got a, he's a fine craftsman, but he's got a, a craft that is deeply valued now. Um, and absolutely could be anybody. Um, and uh, and it, it is anybody. We, we, we met, when we were doing the research, we met a little woman in a Glasgow food bank who was as neat and precise as you could wish. You know, you saw her walking down the street, you think, wow, she's really. You know, a woman of some dignity and presence and really takes care of herself. Um, she came into the food bank and almost wanted to leave because she was so ashamed to be there. Um, and uh, her story, where she'd been um, 
She again had become ill. She was in her early 60s. She'd worked all her life. She was, um, she'd worked in the supermarkets at the checkout. She'd done, you know, that kind of work, but a very, a very, um, somebody was very comfortable with herself, and she wasn't. She was a lovely woman, and, and, and she had an illness, she'd fallen down. They, she hadn't been, they, they gave her the sack because actually they wanted somebody younger. Um, she'd, um, she'd had her family, she'd supported her younger children, so she hadn't any money left herself. Um, she, could, she was probably going to have to move out of the house, so all her money was going into rent. Of, <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. She, if I hadn't had a mic on, I would have been. And then they it's really people as he took to the and with the Yeah. Hi, my name is Marcel. I uh, run a, an organization called Chatterbox, which provides uh, conversation practice classes for language students at SOAS. Some of you may know about already. Um, I'm going to echo what the gentleman said, just an astoundingly beautiful portrayal of reality and so moving. Um, my question is, um, it was all inspired when you mentioned that you come from Nuneaton, um, and I know that town particularly well because one of my university housemates was from that area and I looked with horror as it turned blue two elections ago. Do you know why that is? Why did that happen in towns like Nuneaton? Um, I, I think this is a very, I mean, this is a very important question, really. Um, and I think it's, I, I think it's um, alienation, despair, feeling no one cares about, about you, feeling your voice isn't heard, um, and feeling that the Labour Party of that for decades has really looked the other way, um, has left, industries have died, and there's been no replacement, um, and it's, um, I think it's, it's, it's typical of many places in, in, the, in the depressed areas, um, maybe that's the west, well it's the middle of the Midlands, um, to in the West Midlands, to in, we all know the places where, where it's our equivalent of the Rust Belt, um, and I think I think in all the discussions about that, I don't think we're really understanding it. To me, and I don't know if people here agree, to me it goes back to, it at least goes back to the uh, Thatcher-Reagan um, counter-revolution really, where, not counter-revolution, there's a big shift to the neoliberal politics, where they said that capitalism has got to go full steam ahead without regulation, wherever, whoever it has to make money, that's what we should allow. Um, so the investments can be taken from this place and put where the labour is cheap. Um, we need to make laws against trade unions so people have no defence. Um, and capitalism has to rip. Uh, there was a whole school of economics, wasn't there, the Chicago school. They tested it out in, in Latin America and different countries there. Um, and that's what they pursued ruthlessly. They allowed unemployment to go through the roof half a million or less below to three million within a year. So suddenly there was chaos, suddenly everything collapsed. And we've lived with that at different levels ever since. And, and that, that's, that's the root of it. And then at the same time, the Labour Party went um, from Blair, to, well, accommodated to Thatcher. Neil Kinnock played a dishonourable role in getting rid of the left of the Labour Party and going along with the broad principles of Thatcherism, and um, Blair, of course, was the ultimate example, and Brown followed suit. And people thought, well, they're all the same. They're all the same. So when, when someone comes along and says, do you know what, it's not your fault, it's the person next to you. They're to blame. They've taken your job. They look different. They've got a different language. And it's the old siren call, simplistic answers to a complex problem. And of course, the, I mean, the left is, I think, is now beginning to get the right answers under Jeremy Corbyn, but it's, it's a long struggle. But I think that, that's where really it goes back to, to my mind. And, um, and you meet, I mean, I meet people there, um, and, 
And they're just angry, and they don't know quite why they're angry, but they just feel a sense of disillusion. I wanted to just ask you about authority in general, because I've done a lot of work with the people's assembly against authority. There are a lot of primary voice in this country against authority, then you get right. But I've really come to believe that authority is not about the same money. Um, I think it has a much more sinister edge. And I think it's really about trying to create a culture where there is no compassion or social responsibility or support network. Basically, America. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it uses the um, divisive uh, politics of fear and hate to sow seeds among us of division, <laughs> we blame each other, we turn against each other. And I really believe it's part of this wider shift to create a society where the state has no role. And I, I believe that politics is, is ideas, basically, in the world is set um, by ideas. And I think we have to fight these wicked ideas. And I just wondered, um, what your thoughts were on, on the agenda behind austerity and what you, how, how <coughs> we fight that disgusting value system and reclaim a society where our governments are proud to invest in people, in health, in education. And I, uh, yeah. Yes, amen to all that. And I, I, I think, um, it, as you're right, it, it's based on an ideology. And, and the, the, the ideological base, I think, is that, um, that uh, capitalism is progressive and that in order for it to develop, it must, it must penetrate every aspect of our lives. So that what we saw as a public service is not, is not to be funded by us, it's, it's to be, it, it, it's best um, it's best organized by private companies that we have a yeah. personal relationship with. So if you take a private insurance company and they, uh, they provide private health care and, um, and, and that's the way it should be. Yeah. I mean, but it's also the, the, the demand of capital itself to, to, to expand. It can never find equilibrium. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure there are better scholars here than, than I, but that's, that's, that's as I understand it. They, they have to expand. They, they, they never reach a point at which we say, okay, we're, we're making enough money, and our markets are secure, we just keep doing what we do. They can't do that. They have to expand. They have to take over another company. They have to find another market. They have to cut their labor cost. They have to attack the raw materials so that they're cheaper. So to maintain their market share, they want to maintain their market share, they're constantly having to attack the working class. They constantly have to have an aggressive foreign policy, have a sphere of influence in which their product will 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 um, will, will be sold. Yeah. So they're, they're constantly on the attack, and and that means that um, they're constantly expanding. And if they if they're producing everything that it can be produced, they've got to get into the services. Yeah. So they've got the railways now, and so they've got to um, they've got to get into now health. You know, and the area, I mean, I live in the southwest now, they just voted to allow Richard Branson yeah. to look after social care and some aspects of social care. Richard Branson, he needs another island, obviously, in the Caribbean. I mean, what a disgrace. We cannot, between ourselves, look after each other, except we've got to, someone has to make a profit. Well, I, so that, that's the, I think that's the other idea. Yeah. And sorry, just one thing to add to that. So therefore, to stop people challenging that, they have to say, if you're poor, it's your fault. If you haven't got a job, you are to blame. You haven't filled in your CV right. right. You haven't, um, uh, you've been five minutes late for an appointment. You've, um, you're inadequate, you're not competent. In order to demonstrate that, we now have to punish you. And because you know when sanctions happen, as you were saying, people <laughs> lives are in chaos. Absolutely in chaos. And they can't eat. So hunger, is the weapon, yeah. and you have to you have to ask them 
I've been waiting for my chance to ask this. They never, I've never managed to get up again from the game. I have to ask them, what is the crime for which hunger is the punishment? Because they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, as a wealthy woman, I really think that fitness and disability presents a really big problem for capitalism because they require compassion and imagination and empathy. And I think in a system which tries to um, use human beings as economic commodity and like cogs in a machine, well, those who are different and have different bodies and different health issues, um, some of them far more cogs in a machine. So I kind of think um, disability and sickness uh, really is like, um, well, in a way, it's powering the world. I don't think this system knows what to do because it, if it admits that we should be caring and compassionate to people with health needs, then we should be caring and compassionate to everybody. So I think this system really does not know how to handle um, health issues in any meaningful way. I, I, but you see, that's why they like charities. Yes. They love charities. <laughs> the Queen is patron of them all. You know, they love it. And they get night and they get, they get the peerages. And because they're like, it's the old image of the Lady of the Manor going round on Christmas morning with sweets round the cottages for the tired workers. That's, that's their image. That's how they solve all these issues. Let me do with what we can do collectively. It's charity, and that's why that's why charities are so. I'm going to say dangerous, because they make acceptable what is unacceptable, and and they're a cover. And of course, when you're faced with people who are in desperate need, of course, everyone is going to contribute, and of course, you can't walk by, and of course, you know, we do charity, you do charity, keep them short, and we do it. You know, put on the screen or whatever, <coughs> and of course you can't walk by. But that's what they love, you know. That's their answer. It, it's a pass the hat round society. Is that what they want? Um, I'll let Andy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I've got some story of how the other society, uh, speaking of compassion and also power, I think one of the, in my opinion, one of the powerful sort of underlying yet subtle, I uh, think, messages that I pick up from your film is how individualistic our society is and how the community has been completely abolished in a greater system where the state becomes our main and only core authority for our social relations and um, money, basically. So I don't know if that was one of the sort of deeper messages that you were trying to get at, but I'd love your comments on how the concept of family and the concept of community was missing in the story of these characters. Well, it's interesting that because in a way, it seemed to us. It seemed to us that, that in a way, there were two. There were two conflicting images of, of community. Uh, the, there were the, the people who ran the food bank, and uh, you know, the, his neighbours, um, and um, who, in a way, were and the people at work. And his work community was, you know, they. It was just, you know, the guys at work, really, and, and the crack and the jokes and the. The thing between them, the debate sustaining, um, the, the his neighbours and the people at the food bank, and, and they were wonderful. They, that, that's the actual women who ran that food bank, and, and filthy men, and brilliant. And, and what one thing that just epitomised their kindness to me is that when you know, I mean, you may may well volunteer some of you and take part, but but what touched me, touched all of us, was when the woman said. When she asked her to, to go around with it, she didn't say, come and let me give you some food. She said, let me help you with your shopping. 
and such a such a little thing. But what, what, what you know, what, what a lot it means in you know, preserving someone's dignity. Brilliant. And the state, which in an ideal world would represent the best of us, would represent that, of course, is its absolute reverse. You know, so you, you've got those two images, like, conflicting. Hi, I'm, I'm Claire from Invisible, Living with Visible and Invisible Disabilities. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Ken for coming to the vigil for Lawrence Bond in, in uh, Camden outside Kentish Town Job Centre on the 25th of January. It was Lawrence Bond's funeral today. And he was a, a local man who um, collapsed and died of a suspected heart attack on leaving Kentish Town Job Centre. And he had been cut off ESA for around six months and had been refused at mandatory reconsideration and was waiting for his appeal. And um, so the, there's more information about, about, about the campaign for him on the Invisible <coughs> Facebook page and there's a lot of organisations, Canada Momentum and others, um, Kilburn Unemployed Workers Group involved. And at that, at that vigil we also remembered Lillian Ollup and her two-year-old daughter Lynn who had starved to death in Kent, and they were not claimants in the benefit system, they were seeking asylum. And the asylum seekers were the first to be made destitute um, under labour. And um, so we remembered them, and that's now the standard for everybody. And John McDonnell, who also came to the vigil, he was opposed to the work capability assessment from 2006 when it was a Labour bill and when there was a disability demonstration at the Manchester Labour Conference where we were inside the Ring of Steel and he was the only MP to come and speak to us. And of course now he's joined by Jeremy Corbyn who's supported a lot of the demos. And I think it's really important for us to keep in touch because there's another, there's another cut coming, which is the cut to ESA, driving people in the work-related activity group down to job seekers level, and um, a loss of £30. And also, with the work-related activity group, there's people who've died from being cut off, but there's also thousands of people who've died from the compulsory back-to-work activities uh, people with cancer, heart conditions, and so on. And just with what Francesca was saying on um, being wobbly, being a challenge to society, um, you know, we've always said that disability, living, coping with disability is very hard work. And um, whether or not we do wage work on top, we're already working. Thank you for the film I watched a few months ago. Uh, I was very moved by it. Um, I was in tears at key particular scenes. Um, I would like to say um, you are a master of cinema. I, I love cinema. I'm studying it. When he was born, he came and spoke um, before I arrived. College, so you you make really powerful films. That film is really I, I, I see a lot of people crying. I was in tears the first time. I was almost in tears the second time. Really empower, powerful, emotive film. A big brick at the Tories. Um, I was going to ask um, I was going to ask a question, but maybe I forgot to later. Um, what's a good way of being uh, a better writer? And can I push that question aside? <laughs> um, <laughs> I like the cinema and telling a powerful story. At the same time, I'm not an academic, I'm a filmmaker, um, I want to tell stories. I realise uh, the quote, left is 
can't be losing the argument in terms of the popular mass society or even the mainstream. We need, to, I agree with you a thousand percent. I've watched Adam Curtis' documentary since the last five years. Um, I, I think um, we need to, we need to tell a new story and include the best parts of what we have and reach for something better, uh, a better new alternative to what is going on now. We do have Trump reaching for old ideas, he's reaching in his back pocket for some old 1930s or even some corporate authoritarianism, which I think you've said in interviews. That's, uh, I really don't like that. I am, <laughs> I, I'm either left or right, I must say, I, I'm for the progressive of humans uh, altogether. I like to avert any form of uh, violence being enacted on people. Um, and that's, I guess that's the point of society, is that? I was thinking of the meaning of that. Anyway, uh, what, what new alternative for the future could we ask for or expect or push through? Because remember, when all these, um, with Martin Luther, not only was he doing, um, uh, was he against racism, he was also um, helping, uh, the day he died, or the week he died, he was helping rubbish workers, um, he was helping a union. <coughs> We must push for something better, a better alternative, rather than, and, and it can be done with telling stories. <laughs> well, it, it, um, it, it's a complicated um, <laughs> series of issues that I think you, you bring up there. Um, What's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> it's disentangling the the question of it, I mean, change, yes, I mean, of course, we all want to see change. How can we deal with the pressing problems that we face? Housing, poverty, work, sustainable work, everyone having a place in society, overarching questions like the climate, the, the destruction of the planet. How do we do that? Uh, I, I think, I mean, I've got a very traditional answer, really, which is that we have to plan it. Plan it. Plan the planet. <laughs> because otherwise, if you leave it to the alternative, which is the free market, um, it will go. It will, it's on its way. So we have to plan how we use the, world, the, earth, the Earth resources. We have to plan how we divide up the work. We have to plan what we produce, and so on. You can't plan what you don't own. You know, we can't plan for G4S or whatever it is, we can't plan Virgin, we can't plan you know, the big corporations. So they have to become ours. And we have to, and now how do we decide what the plan is? Well, we have to have some sort of democracy. How do we get there? Well, what's the powerful, what's the most powerful force in the world? I still think the Wayne class is. Because nothing moves without its moved by people who work for a living, or nothing is made, or nothing is sold, or nothing in the shop. So that, that I think, is the traditional answer, but I think that is the powerful force. And it's why, apart from the fact they have the best jokes, apart from the fact they're the nicest people, that's why the working class is important, <laughs> because they have the power. So I think it's about organizing that, it's about the political um, engagement, and it's enormously complicated and complex and strategic and tactical on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's how we harness that strength. So I think it's an old traditional answer, comrade. <laughs> I think it's a very good way, really. I'm a better writer, you can put work with writers, just briefly ask them. the question, how to become a better writer? How do you become a better writer? I'm not a writer, I think it's really important that uh, film directors are not writers. <laughs> and I respect writers hugely. The ones that I know best, the best ones, um, are the ones who listen. Listen, listen how people speak. I mean, first of all, you've got to find a story, a good story, and it seems to me a good story is one where there's an inner conflict, an inner contradiction, 
that you have to tease out and do it truthfully and accurately and with observation. You've got to tease out that story. And when you do it, and it'll be quite small, but if you've got the right story, it has a significance beyond the, that little narrative. So it's, I mean, this is just a little story. But you hope that it has a significance beyond these two characters. And so I think that's finding the story. And, and listening to people how they speak, you know, really capture the rhythm of how they speak. Because it's always unexpected, you know. They don't speak like most writers write. They just speak differently. So I think listening, enjoy language, you know. The best writers really love language. So I think it's those two things. I mean, I don't know, there's lots of ways. Okay. <laughs> I was saying that, can we on the left or the speaker ever find a solution to the problem that I call the BBC? <laughs> um, in terms of the way they portray or not these uh, issues, and then attack people who address them. Yeah. Um, that was one of my questions. Yeah, how can they not open and slightly put the additions back? They're not just a BBC, but how do we Now, you go to option three. <laughs> 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 
Now, just do it from time to time. <laughs> when, 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 you hear, um, when you hear, you know, like questions based on false assumptions, when you hear one side given and not the other, um, when you hear uh, the left discounted, when you hear a trade unionist being asked, why are you holding the public to ransom? You know, that's the usual one. Instead of, what's the justice of your claim? You know, whenever you feel that crossed the line, Give him a ring. Right. <laughs> I'm not very good at having this equipment, as you can see. Oh, God, it's 30 for that one. alongside workers in struggle. He went to the, he stood on the, with the junior doctors on picket lines, he went to the steel workers in South Wales when they were threatened with closure, he's openly supported the, um, the drivers on Southern Rail. No other Labour leader ever does it, not in Miliband, not any, never does it. And to actually identify yourself with that struggle, I think it's absolutely extraordinary. He's the first Labour leader, as I understand it, who is actually now wants to circumscribe the uh, capital, the interests of capital, yeah. to actually take, take, reduce their power. Even Clement Attlee, the Prime Minister that established the welfare state in, in his period, sent troops in against strikers, 
and the welfare state was in order to facilitate the good function of capital. It was to provide a well-housed, a healthy workforce after the war. And, and good, you know, dependable energy, and dependable utilities, transport that worked. So, but it wasn't to establish socialism. So I think Corbyn is absolutely extraordinary. And of course we know he's only there because the right was so arrogant that they thought, oh well, we'll give a left winger a, like a, a pass onto the main competition because nobody will vote for him and um, we can also show how, you know, what a broad church we are. And of course suddenly it backfired, it backfired. Because the people didn't want Blair and Brown and the remnants of that social democratic party. They wanted change. So now the problem is that as far as I know, the left, even those who are not in the Labour Party, and I'm not in the Labour Party yet, but the groups are absolutely support Jeremy Corbyn, support the left in the Labour Party. Of course there will be there will be critical support, there will be people who say, well we we prefer this and we prefer that, but that's fine. I mean that's part of our debate on the left, but there's, everyone would actually support Jeremy on the left and Donald Trump, absolutely. But what we're left with is this rump that came into, into politics under Blair or just before him and voted for the privatisation of the health service, voted um, and wouldn't uh, repeal the trade union laws, um, supported privatisation when Labour privatised uh, the, what's it, the, um, the air traffic control, whatever, supported that privatisation. <coughs> Most of them voted for the illegal war. So they are, they are committed to the politics of the labour <coughs> rights, and they have a sense of entitlement. They feel the party is theirs. So there's a visceral hatred of the left. The, the determination to get the party back, and they will do, I think to me, they will stop at nothing to get rid of it. There's a, it's very interesting, there's an amazing standard tonight. If you look on page four, there's a, um, an interview about talking about Corbyn and whether he, would, he can sustain his position. There's a, a quotation from a Labour MP, unnamed of course, because they're such cowards. <laughs> <laughs> unnamed, he's saying, um, we've stopped attack, you'll find it, it's on page four, the English standard. We've stopped attacking Jeremy now, so if he fails, it's his own fault. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, of course, leaking that quote. <laughs> so, of course, they haven't stopped attacking him at all. I mean, there are one or two outriders, like there's a bloke from Bermondsey, who attacked Jeremy Corbyn for supporting our film, because he said, what a waste to tell people with no money they've got to go and spend £10 at the cinema. <laughs> this is this is the depths of the Labour Party in Parliament. Most of them, they are well. What an Aaron Bevan said about the Tories, I won't repeat it. I mean, they are they are determined to destroy it, and the only way we can fight back is to create the biggest movement. I mean, they, they treat Labour being Labour as though it's a job for life. I mean, they've got more job security than any of their constituents. <laughs> so I, I, I think, I think it needs, everyone needs to get into the CLP, whichever CLP it is, make certain that if, if, they're, if they're one of the 170 who oppose Jeremy Corbyn, that they are not there the next election. Yeah. That is the only way Okay. 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 Okay.
to tell you thank you so much for for these powerful movies. I also I would like to mention in 2006, after watching your movie Bread and Ross, was when became the inspiration of the campaign. And since then we have been inspiration now because throughout the campaign we have achieved the London Living Way, Union Recognition, CPA, Holiday Pay, and after that uh, our step has been followed by all other fellow cleaners. So I just wanted to thank you for uh, to make this inspiring movie so all of us because which reflect the real lives what's happening only to find a work and happen to normal people like us. And yes, I also would like to take the opportunity that on our behalf of not only all the SOAS, our some workers, I want to behalf all the work has been inspired by your movie and our campaigning across London to have an opportunity to have an event with you. Because that, that's what we want because your movies have been so powerful and also the campaign has been so inspiring. And at the moment we're still fighting because this is very easy to not to understand what our source means, our source being injustice and protection. And we want to finish with it. The uh, outsourcing because we don't want to feel any more injustice and protection for many years. And thank you so much again for me. It's a privilege again to watch this movie. And God bless you. Thank you again. I think the, 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 big, the next big step is to get all the workers in house mm -hmm. so that there's no outsourcing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the big thing. Because in the end we can win, you know. as, um, as Shelley said, they are, we are many, they are few, you know, we can win. It's a question of organizing, of being international, of recognizing, and this is a big, big question, of recognizing that workers in other countries are on our side. They, because the, the ruling class set, tries to set, as you were saying earlier, they try to set against, against each other. You know, the migrant is your enemy. No, no. The migrants are part of our side. They're part of our struggle. And, and together we are exploited by the same people. So yes, it's, it's, it's understanding the international nature of the working class and organizing internationally. Trade unions are very good at sloganizing about internationalism. But too often it's about British jobs for British workers. You know, what a, what a terrible slogan that is. It's got to be international. So I think that... You know, it's obviously there's a lot to say, and whoever of people than me will say it. But, you know, that, that's how we begin, I think. Um, independent filmmaking, well, it's be a lovely thing, really. <laughs> um, I mean, so you, you get lucky when you've been around a long time, you get like a, a pensioner's season ticket where they allow you to continue. <laughs> but, but, um, but otherwise, it's a real struggle. And the sad thing is, there are so many brilliant young filmmakers that I meet at many events who, who, who are obviously talented, and you know they're always talented people, talented actors, talented writers, absolutely, who, who, are, who don't get the chance that we got in television, because television is now so formulaic. You know, there are now so many people above you in television. There's the story editors, there's the... There's the um, the producers, the executive producers, the co-producers, the heads of channel, the heads of this, the head of pencils, the head of everything. They all have, a, they all have something to say, they all want to know. Well, you know and they suggest you do this and they suggest you do that. Because they, they, they don't make a suggestion, what's their choice? They've got their job. So it's, there is this inverted pyramid telling you how to function. 
and it squeezes the originality out. So, so that's something else when we democratize the BBC, we'll give the money to the program makers, you know, easy. Um, lots of things, that, lots of big struggles, but the overriding, you were right, the overriding one is the tactical thing immediately is to keep the left leadership in the Labour Party, because we have the chance, one chance in a lifetime, that includes your lifetime probably, one chance in a lifetime have a mass party led by socialists. Don't let it go. Yeah. Don't let it go. Yeah. <laughs>